Okay, Phil, cast your mind back to 2017. You're gearing up for the release of Zack Snyder's Justice League movie. Are you excited? Not really. Well, it's happening again in 2021. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, let's face it, 2017 was a very different time, because it was only 2016 that Batman v Superman came out, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It was a very different time. Um, so it was still fresh in everyone's minds. Yeah, it doesn't feel like we've had many DC movies since then either. To be fair, no. I mean, I suppose the last year, I don't think there's been any really. But even when you can count them all on one hand, you had what Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Shazam, Wonder Woman, 84. Suicide Squad, and Wonder Woman 1984. Are you talking about since Batman v Superman? Yeah. Yeah. Between that and now. Yeah. Oh, yes, insane. Not been many. Um, Yeah. Well, even though the first theatrical run was credited as being directed by Zack Snyder, uh, turns out it mostly wasn't. (laughs) What? Yeah. Uh, And there was a massive fan. That's the first time here. (laughs) (laughs) I know, for a fact, that's not true, because we talked about it a lot on the podcast, and Hmm. isn't it weird casting your mind back to when (laughs) the biggest issue in the world was... (laughs) <laughs> restore the Snyder Cut or whatever it was release the Snyder Cut well there's a there's a video it's probably one of since we changed things over it's probably one of the older videos on our channel that is just called like hashtag release the Snyder Cut mm. it's like our gut reaction to when it was first announced I think you know when the campaign first started which I think was like 2017 mm. and I remember quite infamously comparing it to like licking a switch cartridge because <laughs> Oh, it's kind of a fascination that everyone has, even though I know it will be terrible. <laughs> You're brave for bringing it up again. Um, and it was also a very weird marketing campaign for this, because at like, several points throughout this, these many years, we reported about various states of completion on this movie, and apparently it was there was a cut in Zack Snyder's personal library already done and everything. And did, did Tom Holkenberg no, already, <laughs> already compose the soundtrack, and was it all ready to go? And no, it wasn't, as, as you pointed out. But um, we famously had a had a bet about whether it would be releasing or not, and and I lost on a technicality because it came out later than the deadline you, for the bet. You lost because you got <laughs> too overconfident. <laughs> I said by the end of twenty twenty one, and you said by the end of twenty twenty. Uh, but the reason I kind of bring up our initial gut reaction is just how obviously we'll get into the movie, but I'll say quite happily. That I was wrong that I thought it was going to be like that. The film is actually better than that initial gut feeling. Mm-hmm. But how much better, obviously, we'll get into in our discussion. Yes. I think, yeah. Th- yeah, I- I- I'm on two two sides about this because I, I do think it was much better than the, than the theatrical cut. Yeah. Um, it's a mo- much more cohesive movie. Um, I think we'll just go straight into spoilers because this movie came out four years well, ago <laughs> yeah that's the thing like whilst there is my well there is a, there's a few changes throughout but for the most part I think this is one of those movies that if you're interested you've probably already mm. l- seen it because it's not like having to book into the cinema or whatever obviously in America it's HBO Max over here you can get it on Now TV mm. um, so yes I would say that I also enjoyed it more than f- the theatrical cut because I remember at the time we described the theatrical cut as being like cinema junk food. Yeah. Like, it was it was two hours, but it was pretty vapid. Like yeah. There was nothing really in it. There was no substance. No, exactly. No. Um, I mean, there was a couple of scenes that I, I slightly preferred from the original cut that I weirdly like um, preferred to, to this one. But for as, as a whole, the movie makes a lot more sense and is generally much more consistent. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, so the reason why I say no spoilers is A, at, at the time of recording this they're not restore, hashtag restoring the Snyderverse this is mm. putting a cap on it which I'm oh, actually no I don't really want to say this on in the in the general well I, I was gonna I was gonna what well, uh, gonna potentially suggest that hashtag restore the Snyderverse was a podcast discussion at some point <laughs> yeah. if we really wanted to get into it well, let my... us know in the comments if you want us to go into Restore the Snyderverse my general feeling is I'm 
I mean, neither of us have actually loved this franchise. This, okay. When I say this franchise, I mean the Zack Snyder franchise. So I'm, I'm, I'm including their Man of Steel, BVS, and this version of Justice League. I'm not really including anything else. We were never like super on board with this. I'd watch, no. I'd watch another one probably, but like us, along with the general public, like these didn't make a lot of money, um, and I. I, I think Warner Brothers to give him seventy million and four years to make another cut of this. Like I think I don't want to go. Oh, I don't want to upset everyone and say like that's generous from the studio. But like that that is pretty unprecedented from a studio. So like maybe maybe just leave it there and don't harass people online or do you pro- <laughs> if if you if you want them to restore the. I, <laughs> I've been discussing this with a few people this week, and it is unfortunately. Well, to be honest, it probably was somewhere in the studio somebody put together some kind of cost analysis mm. that said it was going to be overall beneficial to do. I don't know how, uh, unless it leads to about a billion more people getting HBO Max, it probably won't. No. But somebody somewhere in the studio was probably like, "This is, be- you know, this is beneficial for the company for us to do this. The the benefits outweigh the cost." Well, this is unfortunately with these campaigns. And this, you know, goes quite broadly. I'm not just going to target this one in particular. Uh, the phrase, when you give an inch, they take a mile, comes to mind. Mm. And now we're never going to hear the end of this. <laughs> Every time a superhero movie, and I'm not just saying that's going to be a DC thing. I could see it happening on the Marvel side as well. We see it happening with Star Wars. There is going to be a release of bloody blah cut. That wasn't <laughs> the good cut. Go back and try again cut. <laughs> Yeah, you see it with uh, Rise of Skywalker of release the JJ cut. That was his cut. It was just bad. Do you not remember there was a release the George Lucas cut of of Rise of Skywalker as well? <laughs> as if he just filmed. Yeah, his own exactly. Version. He was just there with his iPhone, just like next to JJ. Like, actually, no, I'd I'd shoot it like this, you know. Uh. Yeah, just like very confusing being on set because you've got two sets of cameras basically <laughs> fighting with each other. That's exactly how it works these days. And then yeah. whichever makes them the most money. In fact, it's not even whichever makes them the most money. It's just whoever whoever's fans shout louder. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to go back. Let's get into the actual film itself. Let's ignore all the stuff we've talked about endlessly on this podcast. Um, I, I didn't like the introductory Wonder Woman scene as much as the, in the theatrical cut. Um, well, the, the bank. The bank. Because no, that wasn't a bank. It's music. Either way, she was stopping some robbers. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, bank. Oh no, it was a museum. Yeah, because there were kids on the school trip and stuff. Um, and Bruce Bolton from Game of Thrones comes in and he and he goes to shoot them all up and whatever. But uh, she, like, I was really thrown off. A, the music, the Wonder Woman new music, <laughs> which we've got to talk about. <laughs> every time, every time anything happens involving Wonder Woman. <laughs> Um, and B, she she absolutely tears through those people like killing, which was for me really jarring. Because did you see Wonder Woman eighty four? No, I was considering watching it before Justice League, but I was like, well, Justice League is already like four hours long. I mean, even I've in, heard that nineteen eighty four is like meh. Even if you've watched the first Wonder Woman, and then even more so if you've watched eighty four, like there's a kind of progression of the character where. You notice that stuff like she stops using her sword in 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 eighty four and and she's just very sort of pacifist and she'll mm. she'll use violence as a as defense she'll never she'll never do it to attack it'll always be defensive kind of thing and then this movie opens up and then she just absolutely tears through this room and then for no reason even though Bruce Bolton's now unarmed and has done his party piece and this that and the other she just absolutely does the old crossed in the arms and just blasts him straight through this building like it is it is overkill to the point of being like what yeah <laughs> that wasn't necessary it's insane and, given and, how fast you've been moving you definitely could have just dived across the room and just knocked him out yeah and like it didn't add anything like you know in Batman v Superman the um, ultimate edition they add the blood splats to the warehouse scene Oh, what? Well, where Batman's beating up all the yeah? They had a few yeah. sort of blood scrapes on walls and stuff like that. They they did that with this scene, and I'm just like, this is Wonder Woman. Why why are you doing this? Yeah, like, the whole thing was supposed to be that Batman was in a bit of a dark place himself, yeah, and he was going a bit over the top, yeah. Whereas Wonder Woman never really was like that. No, th- yeah, that was really jarring for me. 
Um, so there's like yeah two things about like the beginning of the film one is that my my friend sat down to watch it before me and I honestly thought he was joking when he texted me saying the first 15 minutes is just all women singing (laughs) I was like no it's not and then I was watching and I was like yes it is (laughs) yeah the Aquaman scene and yeah it's like you say I think Big old There's whiff, cool of, big old sweater whiff in that opening fifteen minutes as yeah, well. Weird. That caught me off guard. It's yeah, like, yeah. <sighs> I like to think that was just a Jason Momoa fan who just wandered onto the set. Yeah, and they just kept it. Yeah. Um, um, and then also just like I think that sequence in the museum. It's a bit of a shame, obviously, about like because I agree with all the points you just made because being a bit longer was a bit better. But also the the speed up and slow down just seem to be at random. Like, but that's obviously that goes throughout the entire film. So obviously Zack Snyder loves this slow mo. Oh, someone worked and out. It just seems like quite random when it slows down and when it speeds up again. Someone worked out the the slow motion scenes in this take up about half an hour, which is the length of an episode of One Division. So just let that settle in for a minute. <laughs> but and also, actually, the length didn't bother me really. I think I, I, it, the pacing was actually, I thought, quite good. Um, what of the it it was but there was still a bit too much I mean obviously if so if you get permission to do like your namesake cut mm. of what will be like the culmination of your trilogy I don't blame Zack Snyder for going all out mm. but there are definitely some scenes that could have been done by being either cut or cut down or oh shortened. yeah that was the, I mean it definitely lost me in the last 15-20 minutes because I hated the new nightmare stuff um, so this is Batman in the desert in the future and that kind of stuff I hated I thought that was awful um, mm. apparently they filmed that different directors in different green screen studios and I, I, I know that's kind of the deal at the moment when you've got limited budget and you've got limited and you've got travel restrictions this that and the other but like god that was awful and Jared Leto's Joker was at his possible worst in this movie <laughs> yeah and one of my my friends was saying it's like it was so incredibly queer coded as well yeah and it kind of follows on from almost like the um moriarty in the new sherlock of a, a very uncomfortable trend of trying to make the villain seem more villainous by making him queer coded yeah did like, you, you s- don't need to do that did you see the video essay um i can't remember who, for the life of me who did it I'll, I'll probably link it below uh did you see the video essay on the lego batman movie and how like the queer coding is done in a in a sort of positive way in that movie between the the Joker and the Batman. Um, yeah, well, it's the kind of thing where if you weren't thinking of it that way, you could just think it as being a riff on. It's like it is queer coding, but it's more a riff on friendships, relationships in general, yeah. that kind of thing. Like the "you need me as much as I need you" kind of thing. Yes, it it doesn't get to like. It isn't dialed up to the point where it's like, oh, he's he's a bit unhinged because he's, you know, threatening. He wants to give you a reach around or something. <laughs> oh my god! In the scene. Yeah. Oh god, I hated that scene. And and the yeah, the dialogue was really bad as well. Like Affleck, the least Batman like line I've ever heard in a Batman movie was like, "When I kill you, and make no fucking mistake, I will kill you." <laughs> it's like. Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to be like the world's greatest. You're the most like one of the most intelligent people in this in this universe, and like make no fucking mistake, I will kill you. Like it's just <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, it's just, and I didn't. And really the fact that the they're filmed, of, in, but... they're filmed in two different complete locations, so you only ever see like it, the camera cropped into like their side profile on a really yeah. badly. Yeah, it's just it was cringy. It was yeah. I just don't see the, what the point of that scene was really because I thought the whole point of the scene in Batman v Superman was to fuel the whole Batman Superman conflict mm. because this was like almost paranoia like mm. Batman was like if you know what if Superman goes rogue this is what could happen at this point in the movie him and Superman are like best buds now and yet he's still worried Superman might go rogue or is it a vision or who who cares I think really? that's the real the real future, although Jared, although the Joker does, does mention that there's multiple scenarios that could play out, but this is what th- that that film and the reason you you questioned sort of why did they do that bit? I think the answer is because that was going to be Zack Snyder's Justice League Part Two. Um, so this was him just kind of going all out and sort of and and throwing everything in because he kind of 
assumes it could be his last his last step into this universe so it it really does go all in um on on what it wants to be um having said that like i i thought some decisions were ridiculous like frankly ridiculous like the inclusion of martian manhunter was another <laughs> another complete waste of time in in my eyes um i understand uh, like he he this was it kind of just felt like um it just yeah kind of felt like sort of circle jerk to to all the times he sort of said to his fans like oh yeah if i did my in my cut this would have happened and i would have included this character and it's like oh shit now i've actually got to do it let's just have him fucking transform into a martha kent even though we just had like a quite a nice touching scene between like the the widowed and the and the mum who lost her son kind of thing it's like yeah. do we need kind to take, turn it takes her a lot in? takes a lot of the emotional weight out of that scene when you realize one of them is just someone else yeah oh yeah exactly and, and right at the end as well when he's talking to batman and he says something like doesn't he say like your parents would be proud or something and it's and as if the world's greatest detective is supposed to just be there and be like oh thanks strange thanks, fucking stranger. green alien <laughs> even though in one movie ago I would literally have got my Wayne Manor security thing to blast you out of into bloody space kind of thing and he's suddenly that, that scene was kind of like unintentionally funny to me I think maybe because it was the end of like a four hour movie and I was just waiting for it to like <laughs> end but it was just the fact that obviously it comes straight after Batman's nightmare so it's implied obviously it's quite early in the morning and Batman just has a look of like, will you just go away? <laughs> <laughs> it's six AM. <laughs> why? Why? Yeah. yeah. Bless him. The um, Martian Manhunt is like, this is the perfect time to come visit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, you say about the perfect time to come visit. Like, where the fuck was this guy? Because he, it's he's Colonel. Is it Lent? No, not Lennox. What's his name? Colonel. Uh, what is Swanwick? Name? Colonel Swanwick from from. He's been in both the previous two movies, and again, I mean Batman v Superman, Man of Steel. He was just chilling yeah. while like the world engine was chewing up that city, and then he was just chilling again while bloody Doomsday was chewing up that city again. It's just, dude, do you want to like step in at some point, or are you just going to wait till Bruce Wayne's having his morning coffee to show yourself yeah, to the world? <laughs> like, <laughs> very, very random, really. I mean, obviously, there's no real other option when you said, oh, Martian Manhunter would have been in my cut, and then you just haven't filmed any <laughs> scenes. It's like, just to do the same as that apocalypse scene, but in, like, the final battle, and that you've got, like, the six of them walking off the plane, and then you just cut to Martian Manhunter in his own shot. <laughs> you just keep doing that throughout the finale. <laughs> trying to make it look like, oh, no, he was there. Yeah. <laughs> he was just always at least one camera pan away from everyone else. <laughs> But no, okay, I, all right. We've we've knocked it a fair bit, but like this was this was a much more solid film. I think like let's let's just go in briefly towards um, the Flash and and Cy and Cyborg, who I think both worked a lot better in this. I think particularly the Flash because they they dialed back the comedy, but it was funnier. Yeah, they well they removed all like the the quippy stuff. Well, that's the thing I was actually quite pleased with this movie in general. Is it was doesn't seem to be taking itself quite as seriously as mm. Justice League or Batman v Superman. Mm. Yet it was still fitting the dark and gritty aesthetic. Mm. Like there's obviously the scene where um, uh, Alfred's making you know uh, Diane's making tea and Alfred's like no do it this way yeah. do it this way which was just like quite good yeah and like you say it removed all like the quippy stuff with the Flash but he still had kind of a bit of an eccentric person yeah I, I found him funnier even though he said less inverted commas funny things brunch etc yeah. um, he felt less forced yeah like there was a scene that kind of could have you could have I mean they did cut on the cut uh, they did put on the cutting from before but the scene where he introduces his superpowers and he he's like he just nabs the, the, the hot dog sausage and then he feeds it to the dog to get a job in like position a bit later I thought that was funny like I, I thought that was a nice bit of actual like clever like humour <laughs> was broadly a better introduction mm. the only bit that was creepy was that he was just stood in like slowed down time just staring at Iris West mm. instead of saving her from the car crash mm. and it was just like it just went across that line of like this is weird yeah <laughs> oh yeah really I mean th it was still too long yeah because of the, the slow-mo and stuff but yeah it was um 
It was quite. But yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like, and then he runs back in, and like she looks around, and he's sat there with all the dogs. It is just like, it does. It is a better representation of his character in one scene as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And uh, obviously, Cyborg gets a hell of a lot more to do in this one. Um, and and well, I think that was a big problem I had with the uh, original theatrical cut was that Cyborg just sort of shows up, and obviously. He ha- already has his powers, but they don't really explain why in the original cut. It's just something, something, mother box mm. magic. Uh, and also, he just kind of... Doesn't he just kind of sense that they're talking about him because of his connection to the network mm. and just goes over to him? Yeah. Whereas, obviously, this shows a lot more of it. Shows, obviously, the he's clocking on to everything that's going on with the power demons and obviously shows his origin, shows his background actually gives us like a full character to him and he's a lot more like he's a lot more essential to the plot I feel totally this. totally yeah and I like how yeah because like obviously the Flash gets a proper introduction in that slow-mo scene and Cyborg gets a proper introduction as well in his sort of mind palace kind of visualizations and stuff and that that does take direction and that that is where this film was a lot stronger than theatrical cut because Zack Snyder does have a vision it doesn't we're not always a massive fan of it, but like, yeah, like, it it worked for this film because you got to see a big, sort of, all admittedly quite CGI heavy, but it was like this big spectacular kind of visualization of of how these guys work in this universe, and I think that yeah, I think it worked really well, and like giving it that runtime as well. There there is stuff you could have cut, but like at least it felt like it built towards the final battle a bit better than because one of our main issues with the DC universe in the first place was like there hasn't been enough movies surely to have a Justice League but then this was kind of two this was like an extra movie before the Justice League movie in one if you know what I mean because obviously that's the thing like the the first 90 minutes to two hours is all set up and introductions Mm. which is needed Mm. but like you say that me the whole end result is that when that f- third act battle begins like you actually know a bit more about all of them mm. and yet it still managed to cut some of like the extraneous scenes from the original cut mm. as well which ex- was just there to explain things and like in the original the flash was like nervous about getting shot or something he had like confidence issues and they just completely removed that mm. and that and it didn't harm the movie in any way really no no, exactly. Um, I mean, the the only thing you can kind of the the worst thing you can kind of say about the final act is the fact that when you have the Flash and Superman together, basically they can bend reality, and there's very little that can be done. Obviously, and bear in mind, I like that kind of twist. I won't go into the details of the Flash using his abilities a bit more in the final act, hmm. but um, and obviously they give it a lot more explaining throughout the movie, hmm. like laying the seeds of it. But it does kind of show like. What threat could take on the Flash at this point if he can if he's already at that stage of his powers? Yes, but I think they do quite a good job in when he does. So when you when you again, I think we should go into spoilers because as far as as far as we're concerned at the time of recording, this universe is kind of dead anyway, and and we know the next Flash movie is kind of loosely based on Flashpoint anyway. So mm. we get a little bit where he's where he's uh, where they're doing the big Superman revival scene, but the only thing that plays out differently in this version, during the actual touching of the mother box and everything itself, is we see Flash run so quickly that we begin to see the mother box rise out of the water again. So we know he's got a bit of his he, time he can run time stream ability. Yeah, exactly. Like he's breaking the light barrier. But he's still quite clumsy, so I think it's not. Uh, it's not. It's, I think it's unfair to say he's overpowered at this point because, like, he'll he'll run at that speed, but then he'll fucking trip over at the end or something. Well, yeah, and obviously he's running around the city at the end, building power, mm. and he gets hit by a stray shot. Mm. And whilst his metabolism is fast, it's not mm. fast enough. Like he's still injured for like, a, and that's enough time for everything to kind of fall apart. Yeah. in the final act. Um. It is just yeah, and then and obviously that's that's just like quite a a cool conceptual thing. Obviously, watching everything rewind whilst he's running so fast, Hmm. especially yeah, especially like the the, when Superman's kind of like broken apart by presumably the anti-life equation or 
Omega Beam or whatever they're going for there, and he's sort of like pulled back together on an atomic level. I thought that was that was really interesting. Um, yeah, and you're seeing yeah you're seeing everything get undone and it will go back into like where the explosion started from. Yeah. Um, I like yeah, I liked the is... use of Dark Side actually. I thought it was it was remarkably quite reserved on, on Zack Snyder's part like you know how m- most of our criticism well not most of some of our criticisms with Batman v Superman was just like he takes stuff from the comics and just does them without any kind of hint of like oh we might use this in another couple of films time kind of thing he's just like I want to do it now I've got all the I've got all the pieces I want to play with my toys kind of thing Darkseid yeah. was used pretty sparingly which which I appreciated um, yeah still not particularly interesting yet um, but then Thanos wasn't particularly interesting in his first couple of appearances. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, what for a long time Thanos was just the blue guy, the purple guy sat in the chair, yeah. and that was it. Until and then he goes like, "Oh, fine, I'll do it myself." And then it's like still like six movies until he does it himself. Yeah. <laughs> and it, to the point where it was even a bit of like a meme, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I know. I think they just do it tomorrow. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there's. I don't know, part of me likes the extra characterization of Steppenwolf, but part of me was also like, did you need every scene where he reports back? Yes, yeah, a lot of face, Obviously, lot of face it was, it was, it, Yeah, it's like, I found another box. Okay, you could have just sent me a text. <laughs> <laughs> I found another box. Yeah, I found it very strange that he goes to Earth specifically to find all these mother boxes, and then... He just kind of like FaceTimes and he's like, Oh, by the way, this planet full of all the mother boxes is the last planet where we lost the mother boxes, and that's where the anti life equation is, kind of thing. And mm. they're all surprised. And I'm like, They not fucking remember what planet they went <laughs> to when they came <laughs> here last? <laughs> yeah, it's like that. That's what I found really strange. It's like, Did they not know? Yeah. Like, were they, um, were they just destroying so many planets you know it's just all the blood yeah we just it's lost count on like the 10th planet dude like <laughs> yeah no it was very very strange that he was like oh this other big thing happened because obviously especially when the the humans had been describing it as like fact like this battle happened here like thousands of years ago mm. but <laughs> the people they were battling didn't even remember <laughs> <laughs> We got a um, one of the cameos I was actually most surprised at, but it wasn't really the the original actor. It was but David Thewlis's, uh Is it, is it was this character from Wonder Woman? Is it Ares, the god of war or whatever? Oh right. Yeah, he he pops up in that fight scene when with with Zeus and everything. Um, but it's like a sort of weird CG version of him. But that was quite a cool cameo. That felt that felt like the first bit of sort of. It felt like this. This movie's kind of like actually done a bit of fore planning for like the first the first time in this in the DCEU, which I found which I found quite cool. Yeah, and this this did feel a bit more, and like even Aquaman stuff felt a bit more connected to his film. It, well, except for Mira's accent. <laughs> yeah, apart from Mira's accent, which seems to change even within this film <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> and the the fact that obviously um in this. They have to move the water out of the way to talk. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah, of course. Like, yeah. Oh, we don't need to do that yeah. anymore. But yeah, I mean, I liked, uh, yeah, that, that, those sort of action scenes as well, where you got Mira sort of like, yeah, sort of doing the, the, the blood bending with, with Stefan Wolf and stuff like that. I thought that, that was quite a. And I, I like the, um, still like the bit, obviously it wasn't the original cut, where he's like swimming around and she's just like, Ali, oop, and the water just all goes <laughs> yeah. and he just falls yes. down. <laughs> Yeah, it's like why don't you just keep doing that? Just like, I am. If you can control the tides like that, the R rating was was um, I I kind of liked it. Like I liked it. I I didn't think it was particularly gratuitous. Um, Like, um, yeah. Some sometimes it's just apart from the Wonder Woman stuff with the blood with the blood splats, like which I thought was unnecessary. I thought the majority of it was fairly restrained up until a yeah obviously you've got the Wonder Woman blood splats and the the Batman saying make no fucking mistake like I, I just I, that was such an unneeded f bomb like yeah i think for the most part there was probably some restraint shown as much as obviously i've been saying that the film could have been edited down a bit yeah like it also could have been far longer and had far more f bombs yeah. far more blood and guts and being a lot even, more humorless. Even so, I do. Appre- I do appreciate how far this <laughs> this kind of DC 
EU has come since like Man of Steel. Could have been even more square aspect ratio. <laughs> Could have been vertical. Would you like that, Phil? Would you want to see a vertical Justice League? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because Superman is flying up here <laughs> and <laughs> Batman's fighting down here. So we need it all to be in shot. So we filmed it all. In the, and you can watch it on your phone. <laughs> Uh, there is a black and white version actually coming out again soon. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. That's the real Snyder Cut. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, this is like a cut. This is a better cut, mm. but I don't know the next time, if ever, I would bother watching it again. Because it's four hours long. Yeah. No, that, that's that is, very That true. is my one comment, is like, he. The only film which I rewatch, and even that's every few years, not like frequently, that is that long, is Return of the King. <laughs> yeah. And Return of the King is better paced as well. Yeah. Like, this film isn't badly paced, but like the Lord of the Rings films are just like perfectly paced for their long run time. Well, what they've got in common is the extended epilogue, which I think we should now, we should now do an, our own hashtag to ban epilogues. Hashtag ban the epilogue. <laughs> Um, Hashtag ban sequel because <laughs> they are they are usually the most sort of painful part of the film to get for, especially when you've kind of yeah you've come to a climax and everything, and it's just like oh, and then all this, and then but then even the epilogue in Return of the King is just it's just following the books, mm. and it's not trying to set anything else up. It's not like <laughs> sequel bait. Sam, <laughs> Samwise goes home and accidentally finds another ring, <laughs> and it just cuts to black. And you're like. <laughs> <laughs> no, Frodo turns around to Sam. I threw the wrong rig away. <laughs> <laughs> that was my nose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pretty good. Not bad. We enjoyed it. 